Do you remember any of your co-stars? Uh, yeah, I do remember conversations with Paul, actually, on the subject, because uh, we were both very excited, because we had just... I think we had just done... Again, not playing... Uh, I can't remember who the lead was in it, but we'd done some stuff about uh, some... Um, uh, Saki, H.H. Uh, Munro, uh, tales, and really sort of plodding, you know. Mm. And we, when we met on The Prisoner, we said, oh, isn't this terrific, you know, we've got something to... Uh, to get our teeth into here, and it's really rather marvellous. Um, I remember that very well indeed. You know, called, uh, the, the trouble with Paul um, is that he's a terrible giggler, and so am I, and we, I mean, we, just, <laughs> we just fall about. So, yes, I remember Paul very well in it. Yes, Guy was there. Well, I'd known Guy before, so we were just friends. No, I mean, nothing particular, really. Just had a good drink at the, <laughs> at the bar at lunchtime. I can't remember much about Virginia. Well, I mean, I remember playing the scene with her, <coughs> with Ginny and that one. Um, I knew her quite well before, and of course, you know, she committed suicide, mm -hmm. which was very strange, very sad. She was a very nice woman and a, and a very good actress. Very mm -hmm. sad business. Um, but no, I can't particularly remember the scene that we played together, mm -hmm. because it. I mean, the unreality was that you actually did disappear after a day of shooting, really. I mean, I think it took about three days to shoot it. Mm -hmm. The whole part, and you were away. And it didn't... Um, I mean, the prisoner didn't do much when it was first shown. Everybody thought no. it was weird. And it was only a few years afterwards that suddenly everybody said, my God, it's a marvellous thing. But at first it was uh, considered to be very way out and what on earth is it all about? Did Patrick ever direct any scenes in your episode? No, no, not at all. No, not at all. He actually had his hands full because he was producing as well. Mm. So he had his hands full. Mm. But no, he, he didn't direct anything. Uh, Don Chaffee did it all. And once you d get a director, you get a director. You don't sort of ride him, you know. Mm. I mean, we, I, I think he directed some later on, but I think he... Don Chaffee certainly wouldn't have you know, wouldn't have uh, stood it if he'd been employed and he wasn't allowed to do his own job. Did you watch the series when it was first shown? I watched it all. Yes, I watched them all. I was, I, I was fascinated. I thought it was a fascinating series, yes. What do you think of the following the series has received? I think it's wonderful. I think it's... Uh, I mean, I don't know quite how it, why it grew up to this extent, but I do see the fascination with it. Because I think, I think, like all good things, uh, it really still has a great bearing on life today, as I, I mentioned, uh, the Guildford Four and all sorts of things. You, and, of course, in the Eastern Bloc countries, they actually tell you people disappear. Mm. And you read Amnesty International and all of that. Prisoners, I mean, can you imagine what the prisoners are going through in, in uh, Beirut? And it's... it's it's an extraordinary mental thing when people decide that they're going to take hostages, which is really what it's about, isn't it? Mm. Political prisoner, really. Mm. Um, and it's very frightening. That's why it'll live forever, really, because uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous piece of work. It's like Kafka. You think reality keeps slip, slipping away, and you think, I must get hold of it, I must get hold of it, and you can't. It's very frightening. Uh, television is such an ephemeral thing. I mean, you. you I mean, that's the sadness. You, you write a book, and the book's there, and you can take it off the shelf, uh, or somebody can stumble across it um, two or three hundred years later, even. But, with, well, actually, television has more chance two or three hundred years later than it has ten or fifteen years later. Mm. Uh, if something's been got a thumbs down at the time of its showing, it's very unlikely to be resurrected. So I think the prisoner's been terribly lucky in a way that you and and uh, people going for it and looking after it and, you know, making sure that it stays. I thought it was a super series, you see. Have you been to Port Merion since the series? Or yes, I have. Not then, you know, but since I have, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I do understand why they chose it for the location. Do you remember the studio set of Number Two's office? Well, I can indeed. I can remember the entire set. It was a, it was enormous set in, 
one of the biggest studios at MGM, which is unfortunately now, of course, gone as a film studio. Mm. Uh, and Don Chaffee was standing there. Don Chaffee directed and Pat. Uh, and the screen was uh, behind the, the chair was enormous. And they were sort of still trying to explain to themselves as well as to me uh, what it was they were after. Uh, and we had a fascinating conversation about how to play it and that he keeps on disappearing. Number two just disappears and disappears, you never know who he is. So that uh, the poor prisoner doesn't actually ever, is never able to get to grips with reality. Mm. Uh, and of course it is a form of torture, isn't it? Did the control room set ever break down? It broke down. Yes, it broke down and Don Chaffee smoked a lot of cigarettes and rushed up and down, but no, it didn't cause terrific problems. It, it worked in the end, you know. But I think that, um, I think Don felt that uh, there was an awful lot of machinery about the entire set. I mean, it was laden with booby traps. I mean, the stuff on the big frame behind and then this and oh, there were all sorts of things that opened, opening sliding doors and all that, uh, all of which could, of course, go wrong. Nightmare for a director.